Okay. Um, thank you again for having me here tonight. I was, um, I'm privileged to be here speaking, and I was listening to um, the President speak about that this society was founded in 1876, and I couldn't help but think what my compatriots in Texas were doing in 1876. Not quite the same world. Uh, so, let's get started. Uh, when faced with the economic questions of shale gas development, there's one key point, it seems to me, that all arguments rest on, and that is the question of reserves. If you can convince people that natural gas is superabundant, then the other economic arguments simply fall into place. If shale gas is truly abundant, then there will be long-term economic benefits for a region, there will be good jobs creation and tax revenues, and there will be royalties paid out over long periods of time and then spent in the local economy, thereby providing induced and ancillary benefits. These are all important and crucial arguments. I would be the last to say otherwise. But what if these reserves are not as sure as industry claims? What if they've been overstated? What if they've been vastly overstated? That's what I want to begin with tonight an in-depth examination of reserves because I think we need to look closely at this to determine just how much benefit we can truly expect from shale gas extraction in any given region. If any of you have heard my other presentations, you may have heard me mention that publicly traded oil and gas companies have essentially two sets of economics. First is what I call field economics, and that's what are the wells doing out, you know, what are my costs and so forth out in the field. The second set of economics is the street economics. And this is, what do I need to do to um, make my financials look attractive and keep uh, analysts in, interested in my stock and in touting my stock to investors? These are two very different sets of economics, and they do not always jive. It's a very important thing to remember going forward. <clears throat> We're going to be looking tonight primarily at the street economics because in my opinion, this has more to do with the frenzy we've seen in shale gas over the last five or six years. I often refer to shale gas activities as drilling for dollars in the capital markets. The primary motivation being to access huge capital investment from Wall Street. Drilling for natural gas was oftentimes secondary, and I believe that a reasonable argument can be made that natural gas in some cases is simply the facade behind which the industry accessed large capital investment which has been used more for land grabs than actual drilling. There has been, essentially, a recipe which the industry employed to affect drilling for dollars. And this included claiming very high reserves, or EUR, which stands for Estimated Ultimate Recoveries, and we'll get to that briefly. Uh, this quite conveniently, by the way, could not be verified for a number of years due to lack of historical production. Number two, drilling for press releases. Number three, claiming long wells, well lives, which holds, holds the promise of long-term economic benefits for a region and its local economy. And number four, showing rapid growth in production, which makes it appear that the strategy is highly successful, a game changer. All of these are necessary to give the appearance of a revolution. Further, I believe that the financial anomaly seen in shale gas would have been exposed long ago were it not for the massive fees that Wall Street investment banks foresaw in this sector. These banks ended up being the primary cheerleaders of this industry, as we shall see. So why are reserves so important? We've all heard a great deal of talk about reserves and resources and 100 years of gas. I'd like to begin by defining reserves and resources and then examining the reasons why they are and why our understanding of them is so vital. This notion that we have 100 years of gas available is misleading at best. I don't care what President Obama said. <laughs> Industry uses this figure, but it simply isn't true in a way that is meaningful. It is a deliberate obfuscation of what geologists refer to as resources versus reserves. The Society of Petroleum Engineers defines resources as potentially recoverable, but not yet mature enough for commercial development due to technological or business hurdles. In other words, it exists but cannot necessarily be pulled out of the ground because of lack of existing technology or it is simply not economically viable. And this is indeed about 100 years worth of gas. Reserves, on the other hand, are defined by petroleum engineers as gas that can be realistically pulled out of the ground at today's prices using today's technologies. 
This is now estimated to be only about 11 years. It's quite a different number altogether. Unfortunately, claiming resources rather than reserves makes it sound as though natural gas is super abundant, when in fact it probably isn't. Obviously, it becomes even more problematic when policy begins to be implemented based on resource numbers rather than actual reserve numbers, and that is precisely what is occurring at present. That is foolish, to my mind, to the extreme. So let's take a look at reserve estimates in several shale plays which have his now have historical production numbers. I think you will begin to, begin to see why policy should not be based on such estimates. There are quite simply far too many questions and red flags falling. For a publicly traded company, reserves are very important indeed because it is one of the primary gauges that investors and analysts use to determine the attractiveness of an oil and gas company. <clears throat> I thought I would let the Clean Skies Foundation, which is an industry-funded group, tell you in their own words why reserves matter. In a letter addressed to the Securities and Exchange Commission, Clean Skies states, companies are evaluated by its shareholders based upon the accuracy of its reserves reporting. In particular, reserves reporting directly impact the amount of capital a company can raise in the marketplace. Reserves are at the core of a company's ability to access funds needed to meet huge drilling demands. But, if the reserve, <clears throat> but what if these reserve reports are not accurate? <clears throat> Interestingly enough, in 2011, I was involved in a project for the Fort Worth Independent School District where I live involving shale gas wells near schools. Chesapeake Energy had projected a royalty figure for the district, which I thought was far too high. I still think it's too high. So I queried Chesapeake about the underlying assumptions they had used to calculate this figure because, of course, they had published them they had just published the high royalty figure and not the assumptions on their website. They came back to me and said they had used an average EUR, or estimated ultimate recovery, of 3.0 in their projections. I found this of great interest. Why? Because in 2006, Netherland and Sewell, a highly respected reservoir engineering firm, determined the average EUR for a Barnett whale, Barnett shale well, was 1.135. BCF based on historical production history filed with the state. Another estimate was done in 2011 on a much larger sample of wells, which incidentally would also have included all the so-called improvements in technology which industry claims have occurred, and the numbers for the play were still between 1.0 and 1.5, with Chesapeake actually at 1.5 BCF. But <clears throat> as you can see, Chesapeake's claim of 3.0 is twice as high as the average actual production for their wells. So is this an aberration? Well, let's look at another example from a different shale play and see. Powers Energy Investor is an, thank you, is an industry publication. And in its April 2011 edition, they stated the Fayetteville Shale, which is in Arkansas primarily, has reached peak production, and by the way, that was only six years after uh, drilling began, has reached peak production based on information available by the play's leader, Southwestern Energy and the Arkansas Oil and Gas Commission, it appears that the meteoric production growth of America's third largest shale play is a thing of the past, a mere six years after it had began. The report goes on to state another significant misconception surrounding the Fayetteville is the size of EUR per well. In its quarter two 2011 earnings call, CEO Aubrey McClendon of Chesapeake Energy announced that it had moved up its EUR per well from 2.4 to 2.6 BCF. To put into perspective how ridiculous Chesapeake's claim of 2.6 BCF, consider the following. Of the company's 742 wells completed on the Fayetteville, only 66 or 9 percent have produced ever more than one BCF and none, none have ever produced more than 1.7, and yet they're claiming 2.6. Southwestern Energy has also upped its EUR in the Fayetteville from 2.2 to 2.4. The Powers Energy Investor, which as I stated before is an industry publication, concluded that there's little doubt that Chesapeake and Southwestern have grossly overestimated their EUR per well. For example, they said, of the 594 wells drilled between, that doesn't matter, are unlikely to ever produce more than one BCF. 
there's no doubt that the Fayetteville operators are using unrealistic decline curves and B factors that are unrealistically high. And I'll get to that in just a moment. Lastly, I wanted to go to the Haynesville shale. And you may be wondering, why am I discussing the Barnett, the Fayetteville, the Haynesville when we're up here in the Marcellus? It's quite simple, actually. All shale plays are essentially the same. So whatever has happened in the older, more mature plays, um, we're seeing a pattern, as, you can, as, as I'm beginning to point out here. And um, I call it a cautionary tale for the Marcellus. So lastly, we go to the Haynesville and take a look at EURs there. All operators in the Haynesville claim EURs somewhere between 5 and 7.5 BCF. Actual EURs based on historical production filed with the states, so there's no wiggle room in these numbers, are Petrohawk 4.5, Encana 3.5, EOG 3.0, and Chesapeake 2.75. Clearly, there is a problem with extraordinarily high estimates of reserves. But perhaps most problematic is the fact that these companies have been allowed to borrow monies based upon reserve estimates rather than actual production history. One may well ask, how are they coming up with these high numbers, such high numbers? Well, it's interesting. A high EUR can be calculated by using what is known as a B factor in excess of one. As the Powers Energy Investor stated earlier, it, it can produce unrealistically high reserve estimates. Dr. John Lee, who was a petroleum engineer and the architect of the Securities and Exchange Rule Change for Oil and Gas, uh, puts it this way. A B factor in excess of one can produce physically unreasonable conclusions. I'm not a petroleum engineer or a geologist, but I'm going to very quickly talk about B factors. And don't worry, I'm not going to throw some esoteric mathematical exercise at you. But I think you will find this interesting. The Society of Petroleum Engineers themselves have cautioned about using a B factor value greater than one. In 2008, SPI uh, claimed that using a high B factor to estimate shale gas reserves, quote, yields enormously high reserve estimates which have nothing to do with reality. And yet some of these shale companies routinely use B factors in their investor presentations which were at times substantially above one. For instance, Petrohawk used B factors of 1.1 and Chesapeake Energy as high as 1.4 to 1.6. When shown a Petrohawk Hawk chart by the New York Times, Dr. Lee said, quote, he saw no evidence that the company had used any assumption to correct for the resulting possible overestimation. He told the Times in an email that if you find other cases like this and you can establish that no minimum terminal decline was imposed, you may have identified overstatement of reserves in those cases. So what did the Times do? They went back to Petrohawk. And they asked, and Petrohawk claimed that they had used a B factor now of 0.9 instead of 1.1, which is still quite high. But interestingly, Petrohawk, after the Times questioned them, quit using the model altogether in their investor presentations. Number two, drilling for press releases. Because reserves are so important to the capital needs of a publicly traded oil and gas company, it becomes necessary to promote reserves and particularly any new growth in reserve estimates in order to promote one's share price and gain access to additional monies. Aggressive PR campaigns began to be used to facilitate such promotion. Industry insiders referred to this as drilling for press releases. Monster wells are the darlings of industry PR departments. Monster wells have a very high initial production rate, or IP rate as the industry calls it, in the first 30 days of production. Companies announce when they've hit a monster well by sending out a press release accordingly. In the early days, it was assumed that unconventional wells would perform in roughly the same manner as an old-fashioned vertical well. Uh, and so a high IP rate was considered a good thing. But we know now that unconventional wells, drilled horizontally, do not necessarily perform like conventional conventional gas wells. In fact, the so-called horizontal monster wells can actually die off rather more quickly, in fact, within a matter of months, um, much more quickly than the moderate initial production wells. According to an email which was leaked to the New York Times, a Chesapeake geologist wrote to a federal energy official explaining how gas flows from these so-called monster wells. Some rocks only flow through the gas, th flow gas through the fractures, he said, and so they have huge IP rates and then quickly die off in a matter of months. Other rocks were able to flow through the matrix 
and these wells decline much, slowly, much more slowly over years. So according to the Chesapeake geologists, it's simply a matter of the porosity of the rock and how the gas will flow and how much will flow. Further, there's no guarantee that these wells will be long-lived or sustain large reserves. And yet these are the very wells that industry loves to tout in press releases. Why? Because they can claim huge reserves and potentially borrow more monies immediately based upon such claims. To reiterate this point of the need for high IP rates, I'd like to quote an industry blog site from the Eagle Ford Shale in South Texas, which states, high IP rates may be good for the investor reports, but perhaps not that great for the landowner in the long run. As a landowner, you don't have any choice in the matter as to how hard an oil company flows a new well on your land. So too bad if they let it burn out early to boost numbers reported to investors. By the way, Chesapeake Energy is currently involved in a lawsuit regarding this very thing. The plaintiffs allege that Chesapeake has overproduced wells in order to meet production targets set by some of the large Wall Street investment banks. But this brings up another interesting aspect in drilling for press releases. According to a former Halliburton advisor, horizontal wells are not always the best way to harvest shale gas, but drilling for press releases wins out over more prudent decision making. He states, most com companies are interested in a very high IP for a press release, which leads to multi-fractured horizontal wells as the preferred practice. However, production declines, <clears throat> however, as production declines, re-stimulation becomes necessary, but the industry doesn't have a good method for re-stimulating horizontal wells. Vertical wells may be a better approach. Yes, but Wall Street has made it quite clear that they are not interested in investing in vertical wells. The monies have almost completely dried up for conventional, conventional drilling. This sector of the oil and gas business has been absolutely decimated financially. Therefore, the question arises whether these shale gas companies are responsibly mining these minerals, which they have an obligation to leaseholders to do, uh, simply in order to meet the criteria and preferences that are being set, once again, by large Wall Street investment banks. So we've seen that companies love to drill for press releases. We've also seen that people working within this industry are seriously questioning reserve calculations, and we've seen that actual production history is not correlating to company claims of reserves. So what's next? The claim of long well lives and the booking of reserves in company financial statements, which cannot possibly meet SEC requirements. After the Times article came out last summer, the SEC began issuing subpoenas to a number of shale gas companies, and one of the things they are examining is the method of reserve estimation. According to Ryder Scott, a premier reservoir analysis firm, 80% of the top 50K oil and gas companies were issued comment letters by the SEC in 2010 regarding anomalies in their public filings or reporting. This in itself is not so unusual, but some of the comment letters address the length of well life in PUDs, which stands for Proved Undeveloped Reserves, <clears throat> which were being calculated by some of these shale companies at apparently what the SEC termed as mathematically impossible rates. Under the new rules, companies must develop PUDs within five years to move them off their books as undeveloped to developed. This is just a basic investor protection to ensure that companies do not book or claim reserves, um, but never actually get around to developing them. That would, of course, make their prospects look quite attractive without having any basis in reality. Interestingly, many of the shale companies were claiming PUDs that could not be developed within five years. So let's have a look. Devon Energy, uh, this is according to the Oil and Gas Financial Journal, by the way. Devon Energy, it would take them 9.1 years, Range Resources 11.8, Chesapeake Energy 13.1, and Apache Corp 15.1. Now, after you've been doing this a while like I have, when you see something like W&T offshore 104 years, you find that very humorous indeed, and so I thought I'd throw it, throw it in there for a little comic relief. Um, as you can see, none are in compliance with the SEC rules. <clears throat> so let's examine some of the comments very quickly, which the SEC has issued to some of these shale gas companies regarding uh, the claims of PUDs and long well lives. This is the first comment. This letter uh, went out to a number of shale gas companies. Uh, it said, and this is just an excerpt from it, but basically the Securities and Exchange Com uh, Commission said, therefore at this rate of development, it will take at least 50 years for you to develop all your PUDs, assuming that no additional PUDs are added during that time. Tell us how this complies. On well lives, they said, all proved reserves must, must meet the standard of reasonable certainty. There, please tell us 
Therefore, please tell us the evidence that you have that horizontal wells in this reservoir for properties in question will produce for 50 years and in some cases longer. Now the companies, when they respond back to the SEC, can ask that their names be, and their, their responses be redacted, which they always do. But I thought this was rather funny because you can tell exactly what the companies came back with in SEC's response. Um, and here it is in brief. In regards to your response, as we stated, all proved reserves must meet the standard of reasonable certainty. By assuming well lives that only a small percentage of vertical wells have achieved, it does not appear that your re reserve estimate is reasonably certain to occur. Therefore, please revise your filing. <clears throat> so at least somebody in government is doing their job, right? <laughs> In January 2012, pl prices plunged to 10-year lows due to a market glut from overproduction. According to the Department of Energy, production in 2011 reached 4.5 billion cubic feet per day, but demand was a mere 920 million cubic feet in comparison. So production exceeded demand by fourfold. Operators have explained this in two ways. Firstly, most have claimed this is overproduction is simply because they are so good at what they do. They've affected a shale gas revolution when in actuality overproduction probably had more to do with meeting debt service. Uh, and secondly, some companies are now going so far as to promote low prices as their intent all along, as some sort of gift to the people. I find this second claim so egregiously outrageous that we're going to examine it in some detail uh, and expose it for precisely what it is, which in my mind is shamelessly blatant spin. Last month, both Con or, it wasn't last month, excuse me, uh, in January, ConocoPhillips and Chesapeake, Phil Chesapeake Energy announced that they would cut production in order to stabilize prices in the gas markets. That was when gas was still at about $2.50. It's now at $1.85. Unfortunately, there's some question as to whether these cuts are very meaningful, as you can see. Um, but I included both of these quotes from, um, one is from the CFO of ConocoPhillips and the other from Occidental Petroleum. One of the problems with these production cuts is that you can cut production in dry gas, which is what the companies announced, but unconventional oil produces gas as a byproduct. And so whatever you're cutting in dry gas obviously isn't, um, isn't meeting or isn't having any meaningful effect because they're still pumping gas into supply capacity from unconventional oil production. <clears throat> but there's another problem. Um, Chesapeake announced that Chesapeake plans to defer completions of dry gas wells that had been drilled but not yet completed and also plans to defer pipeline connections of dry gas wells that have already been completed. I posited in presentations shortly after these announcements were made that there was potentially another aspect to these cuts, and it was highly curious to me that the cuts announced were only in the Barnett and Haynesville and only for dry gas. It seemed quite suggestive to me that the cuts were very simply house cleaning of embarrassing assets. Uh, Chesapeake's press release, I think, um, lends a lot of credence to that argument. It's quite clear that millions and millions of dollars have been spent to drill wells that will never be completed and or hooked up to pipelines now. Further, this land has suffered environmental degradation but will now not produce revenues of any kind in the way of royalties or taxes. It's essentially an abandonment. Further, the land is virtually worthless since no complete reclamation plan is in place and therefore cannot be used for any other purposes. I've been arguing for quite some time that shale gas wells, because of their questionable economics and vast land consumption, may not be the highest and best use of the land. By the way, Dr. John Lee, the architect of the SEC rule change, wrote to me in an email last year that 20, they expect 20% of shale gas wells to carry a play, and he said the other 80% can easily be uneconomic, and that is a quote. 80% of shale gas wells they expect will easily be, I mean, they expect them to be easily uneconomic. So I think my case that um, shale gas may not be the highest and best use for the land is getting quite stronger. This, by the way, is not the first time that producers have announced cuts in production in an attempt to stabilize prices. It happened last in 2009. Reuters did an interesting piece recently which highlighted what had actually occurred back then. 
According to Reuters, Chesapeake's production actually rose after cuts were announced as increasing input from new wells more than offset set cuts it made at existing facilities. And Chesapeake went on to ramp production back up just a few weeks after announcing the second reductions. Reuters concluded that the doubling of cuts announced as prices continue to decline could have only lasted 26 days at this rate. Now you may be wondering why would they do this? Well, it was very interesting because um, just a few months after these cuts were announced and they ramped back production, ramp production back up very quickly, um, Chesapeake Energy was downgraded by Fitch as being at risk of debt breach. I have been making this argument since 2009 that the overproduction we've seen in shale gas has much more to do with meeting debt service than anything else. Uh, it seems highly suggestive that meeting debt service won out over stabilization of the markets. Martin King, an analyst at First Energy, stated in the f a few weeks ago that in the past, those that shut in wells typically talked up a storm, but when the data finally came in, little had actually been shut in. Further, it looks as though oversupply will continue in 2012. Uh, Reuters stated that the U.S. government has announced that the production forecast for the second time in 2012 has been uh, moved up and uh, for the second time since production constraints were announced, excuse me, has been moved up. Uh, EIA now expects output to climb to 2.6 percent versus, or to climb 2.6 percent versus last year to a record high. Obviously, production cuts this time around also are not very meaningful. Now I want to quickly address that second point which I mentioned earlier, which is the claim by some operators that low gas prices are some sort of gift to the people. I found dozens of references to this, but I decided in the end to use this one for illustrative purposes. I chose the keynote address at the Gas Insights Conference held in the Marcellus last September. This conference was sponsored by the Marcellus Shale Coalition, which of course is an industry-funded group. So I think it's safe to consider this address as indicative of what the industry purports as a whole. They stated that this new energy supply revolution in the U.S. is so enormous that American manufacturers now enjoy natural gas costs that are the lowest in the world. Since 2008, the abundant supply of natural gas has dropped the price of natural gas by 67 percent, providing an economic stimulus of $250 million a day. That, by the way, was said when gas was at $4. We're now at $1.86. The stimulus is much greater now. Um, far exceeding any benefit, they said, that of government stimulus efforts that are inflationary and simply add to the debt burdens we are passing on to our children and grandchildren. Violins and flags waving here. Um, this domestic energy cost advantage is already attracting industrial jobs back to the U.S., they said. Okay, this begs the following rhetorical question in, to my mind. Are we to truly understand that the natural gas industry has worked diligently, putting its own interests aside to deliberately drive, gases, drive the price of gas down to 10-year lows so that, one, manufacturers can enjoy natural gas costs that are the lowest in the world, number two, and that we will all enjoy an economic stimulus of $250 million a day provided unselfishly by America's Natural Gas Alliance, though this has placed some natural gas companies literally on the brink of bankruptcy, and number three, that the domestic energy cost advantage could attract industrial jobs back to the U.S., even though producing this gas to this extent in turn jeopardizes tens of thousands of jobs within the natural gas industry itself. All of this out of the goodness of their hearts. Quite to the contrary, I think. In an earnings call for financial analysts, Mr. McClendon of Chesapeake Energy stated the industry's goal was obviously the holy grail for our industry is to have gas achieve oil pricing parity in the U.S. With crude prices hitting all-time highs in 2011, oil pricing parity could not possibly result in low gas prices or the above-mentioned benefits to the American people. Th these benefits of jobs and economic stimulus only accrue if natural gas prices remain depressed for the long term. But if gas prices remain depressed for the long term, it will prove exceedingly difficult for these companies to continue the shale gas revolution. They will be driven out of business. Gas prices are at 10 years lows for one reason and one reason only, because these operators continue to produce all the way down this slippery slope and have glutted the market. Any attempt to spin this as a gift is just that, spin. Now, just a brief note on jobs creation. 
according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. A low point for the employment in the oil and gas extraction sector occurred in 2003 with approximately 118,000 jobs. And by the way, this is for all um, oil and gas extraction workers onshore and offshore, not just shale gas workers. This is for all oil and gas extraction workers. Um, so we hit a low in 2003 of 118,000 jobs approximately. By year in 2011, we were up to 186,000 jobs, which was about a 56% um, gain in jobs over a decade. That's approximately a net gain of 67,900 jobs. But let's put this into perspective. This job creation amounted to 1 20th of 1% of the overall employment figures for the US. There are currently 12.8 million people unemployed, a growth of 67,900 jobs in the entire oil and gas sector, onshore and offshore, during a period of game-changing, revolutionary activity in the natural gas markets, demonstrates to my mind, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that jobs creation is overhyped to an unconscionable degree. Industry also has gone so far as to claim that we will pick up up to 800,000 new jobs thanks to low gas prices. Industry is well known for using extraordinarily high multiples in estimating induced jobs. However, let's assume just for fun that they actually create this many jobs. And then let's put this into perspective. The US has a labor force of 155 million and it, the current unemployment rate is 8.2%. If they created all the jobs they say they will create, which is highly unlikely, this will drop the unemployment rate, as the London Financial Times so aptly noted recently, to a slightly less dismal 7.7%. Again, not a game changer considering its supposed revolutionary status. Lastly, I want to conclude with a section that I've I'm calling financial codependency. Um, <laughs> I'm of the opinion that this frenzy in shale gas would have been exposed long ago if it weren't for the massive fees that the large Wall Street investment banks could potentially envision in the M&A sector and in trading for their own accounts in shale gas. The mergers and acquisitions market for shale gas has exploded in the past year to 18 months. According to Platt's Oil and Gas Reporter, which is a preeminent industry publication, shale plays accounted for 80% of the 28.1 billion total, quadrupled the value of shale deals done only a year prior. Shale accounted for 46% of all ener energy M&A, and those figures are for one quarter and one quarter only. This equates to substantial fees. Energy M&A has become one of the most lucrative profit centers for these banks. I would like to delve into this financial codependency a bit further because I think it's important to note the driving forces behind this so-called revolution have not only been the aggressive reserve estimations and convoluted financial engineering of shale gas companies themselves, they have been enabled on a massive scale by large investment banks on the, for, on the street who foresaw massive fees and spun the hype every bit as much as the companies. Since Chesapeake Energy, I hate to pick on Chesapeake, I really do, but <laughs> since, they have, uh, since they announced that they intend to issue more senior notes and divest more assets in off-balance sheet transactions in an attempt to shore up their ailing balance sheet, I thought we might look in depth to see what role these Wall Street banks are playing in, that very, in those very deals. So, let's have a look. The banks that are involved are Goldman Sachs, B of A, Merrill Lynch, Deutsche Bank, Morgan Stanley, Royal Bank of Scotland, and Jefferies. So then I thought it would be fun, for illustrative purposes, um, to examine the analyst recommendations by the same banks um, that are underwriters and advisors and therefore stand to make the most money off of this, these Chesapeake deals. Take a look. Actually, Goldman came out okay in this one. Um, Goldman is neutral, but you have essentially three buys on Chesapeake stock, uh, and then you have a couple of neutrals, essentially. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions about, um, <clears throat> excuse me, from, uh, about the recommendations from the very banks who are making such large fees off these transactions, but I will end with comments from other analysts at other firms that are not making huge fees off of Chesapeake transactions. In the deal pipeline, which is an M&A uh, industry publication, dated February 15, 2012, 
or two days after Chesapeake's announcement, an, an analyst stated, Chesapeake is in serious trouble. Its Enron style of media hype, off-balance sheet accounting, and excessive leverage has finally caught up with him. The end appears to be close. And this was before we learned of 1.1 billion in unreported loans by Aubrey McClendon last week. Um, it should also be noted that Zacks has placed Chesapeake Energy on bankruptcy watch with an Altman Z score of 0.84. Anything below 1.80 is considered to be at high risk for bankruptcy. And lastly, Neil Anderson of Wood McKinsey, a premier research and consultancy company, stated, it seems that the equity analyst community has played a key role in helping fuel the shale gas M&A market, acting as the chief cheerleader for shale gas plays. I will conclude tonight with a comment that I truly wish I could take credit for because it's so brilliant. I really wish I could take credit for this, but I can't. It belongs to Warren Buffett. He made this comment after the economic meltdown in 2008, but I find it extraordinarily apropos now with regard to shale gas companies and the current price of natural gas. Mr. Buffett said, when the tide goes out, that's when you get to see who's been swimming naked all along. Thank you.